I like to look at old machines. They're a window to the past. Things were made with pride back then. These things were built to last. An inventor who is long since dead has left his work behind. So I search for, as I hold his work, the thoughts in this man's mind. My wife and I visit antique shops, and I'm always scanning the room for old typewriters. I've gotten pretty good at noticing the size and shape of what might be a typewriter, like this small black case. The sloped top is a good sign. It's an old Remington portable. I just scan the room for cases that are about the right size and shape. This might be one. I thought the case was upside down at first. It's not a typewriter, and it wasn't upside down. I think it must be some sort of phonograph, but phonographs have a tone arm, and this thing doesn't. That looks kind of like a speaker, but there are no wires going to it. I spent some time figuring out how it works. It's really an amazing piece of engineering. The needle is connected to the paper speaker cone. When I was a kid, somebody showed me how you could play a record with a hat pin poked through a piece of paper. If my sisters are watching this, I promise I did not do this to your records. As the needle rides in the groove of the spinning record, this whole unit glides along ball bearings. And this knob allows you to adjust the position of the needle to the edge of the record when the lid is shut. This lever first unlocks the playing mechanism and starts the record spinning by releasing the turntable brake. Then it lowers the needle onto the record. The sliding shutter provides a volume control. I love the design of the handle, which doubles as the winding crank. I never have figured out why the latch is upside down. There's a storage compartment, but the spring motor doesn't leave enough room for records, so I don't know what you'd put in there. I want to put a record on and see how it sounds. I can hear the turntable coming up to speed. Now I'm going to slowly lower the needle onto the record. I want to try the volume control slider. I wonder what I can learn about the designer. The label calls it a vertical playing phonograph. That would explain the clamp that holds the record in place. And it says Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. I remember seeing a publication called The Watchtower put out by Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't know a lot about that group, but I'm aware they went door to door to spread their message. I searched for what I could find out about their connection to this machine. In the 1930s and early 40s, the church reports often mention large numbers of phonographs and other sound equipment. This magazine page shows how they used loudspeakers mounted on vehicles to replay their radio broadcasts. They went door to door with small phonographs, and they even played their message from a boat on the River Thames. You see the older style phonograph, and then in the corner you see the new upright phonograph that was introduced in 1940. The sound cars were a display of technology that would have been hard to ignore. There were two styles of watchtower phonographs. The earlier one was this model, much more like other phonographs on the market at that time. Let's see where the watchtower phonographs fall in the overall timeline of phonograph development. Reproduction of sound started with Thomas Edison in 1877. There was a Frenchman named Martinville who, about 20 years earlier, had recorded sound with a needle attached to a diaphragm that scratched a soot-covered surface as it vibrated. But he had no means of playing back the sound. 
So practical reproduction of sound started when Edison's vibrating needle dented a sheet of metal foil wrapped around a cylinder, which could be played back so the dents in the foil would vibrate the needle and produce the sound. The first phonograph you could buy had cylindrical shaped records, and later disc style records came out but they all work by a needle vibrating a small diaphragm, which was amplified by a megaphone-shaped horn. Later, they developed the idea of the megaphone shape being built into the body of the phonograph, as seen in this Victrola portable model. The earlier style watchtower phonograph was of this design, only built in a planar, utilitarian fashion. This guy has placed his watchtower portable on a cart so he can more easily set up to share his message. Then the group built special carts that held the record players and some literature. Radio and electronic amplification became popular in the late 20s and through the 30s, and they got away from the horns and used the dynamic speakers with the paper speaker cone. It's an interesting innovation to think of connecting the needle directly to a paper cone with no electronics involved. Everything about the design is really brilliant when you consider what it was built for. Battery technology at that time was insufficient, and asking to plug an electric phonograph into the prospect's house would not have gone over very well. Even the styling fits the purpose perfectly. From the outside, you see a high-tech stylish appearance, but on the inside, it's very plain and practical, rather than ornate the way most of the commercially available machines were in those days. And from these photos, it looks like the compartment in the side was made to carry a Bible or other literature. Let's hear this machine reproduce the sound that it was built for. What the immediate future holds for the people is of great concern to all families that desire peace and life. The prospect looks dark to those who desire righteousness. <clears throat> Parents are in perplexity as to what they can do to protect and safeguard the interests of themselves and their children. This brief speech is to draw the attention of all such to the gracious provision which the Almighty God has made for those who sincerely desire good things. To learn of His provision will comfort those who mourn. When studying an old machine, it's always exciting to be able to look at the actual patent drawings. It's surprising to see these patent drawings look so much like the finished product. That actually gives us a clue as to the timeline of this machine's development and its patent application. We know this model was introduced to the group at their convention in late 1940. This drawing is from a patent application filed earlier that same year. It has the same basic ideas, but in a much more complex configuration that would have been much harder and more expensive to build. It looks like, until mid-1940, they were working from the old drawings, and as they continued to make refinements and improvements, they went into production in mid-1940 with the design that we see in this machine. After they were in full production for a few months, they filed the patent application showing the new design. The inventor of this brilliant machine is John Curzon. For several years, the Jehovah's Witnesses yearbooks mentioned three Curzons in the list of ministers. Extensive searching online gave me very little info on the inventor. I did find a brief history of his family. His grandmother in Ohio subscribed to Watchtower magazine around 1900. Of her 11 children, only two of her sons wanted to be involved in the group. One of them was John G. Curzon Sr., a school teacher who had three kids, Esther, Russell, and John Jr., our inventor. Russell moved to Jehovah's Witness World Headquarters called Bethel in Brooklyn, New York in February 1934 to serve on the staff. John Jr. joined him there a few weeks later and they roomed together until John married Jesse in 1953. Russell wrote, John put his technical skills to work at Bethel and collaborated with other Bethelites on such projects as producing portable phonographs. Thousands of Jehovah Witnesses used these in their house-to-house -house ministry. John also helped design machines for wrapping and labeling magazines that were mailed to individual subscribers. I found a notation on a member's discussion site where someone said, Does anyone remember John Curzon? Wondering if anybody knows what happened to his wife, Jessie. 
John was responsible for inventing that record player used by the witnesses in their door-to-door work in the 30s or 40s. He was probably the sweetest, smartest, and most humble person I ever had the privilege of knowing. John G. Curzon, Jr. is buried in the Watchtower Farm Cemetery in New York. It's near the rural headquarters of the Jehovah's Witnesses. I expected to find some mention of this man in the many publications where the phonograph was mentioned and obviously very highly regarded, especially in the article that announced the new upright phonograph, and it would have been nice to see a photo of him announcing it at the big convention. But maybe it was the church culture to avoid seeking glory, or maybe it was Mr. Curzon's own shyness that kept him out of the spotlight. I think I might have liked to have known him. He certainly made a good impression on the church member who wrote about him. We at least know that he did a wonderful job meeting the specific requirements for an important task, and he did it in a simple, practical, and elegant form. I've enjoyed getting to know a little bit about John Curzon through his wonderful machine.